today, and thank you for all, all for coming. I'm John Eric, I'm the Executive Director of the OSGI Alliance. And um, if you're not a member of our fine group yet, we certainly would appreciate your uh, thinking about joining. You can find out more about us at OSGI.org. Uh, we're doing a lot of great work, and we'd love to have the help. So, or come talk to me after things talk. I'll be around all today and the rest of the tomorrow. So, we'd love to talk to you about it. In any case, um, it's with great pleasure that I introduce Tim Ward from Paramus. And he is going to talk today on asynchronous event streams when Java met OSGI and I've shortened that. Tim is a principal engineer at Paramus, uh, co authored the OSGI, Enterprise OSGI in Action, and has been actively working with OSGI for over six years. He is a regular participant in the core OSGI core platform and enterprise expert groups and is uh, doing wonderful work as our interim IoT expert group chair. So we just recently launched that and I hope you've been hearing about it. Um, Tim is also active in open source committer and PMC member of the Apache Aries project which provides a container for enterprise OSGI applications. Please join me in welcoming Tim. So, hello everyone. Now, uh, I've used the word asynchronous in the title, and I'm also talking about something that only arrived in Java 8, which is you know, a surefire way to make sure that you get a few extra people, because it's still considered sexy, at least for <laughs> a little bit longer. So I thought I'd start by talking about data structures and algorithms. Everybody happy? Uh, you, you remember Computer Science 101. Uh, so the thing about these is whether or not we really think about data structures and algorithms, they are kind of important to what we do. You know, we, we don't always like to say, yeah, I, I you know, spent ages going through the, uh, the order of how long this is going to take, but sometimes it does matter. Knowing stuff like when to use a list or a set or a map, it matters. We, we tend to get it right, because it's not always that hard, but you need to understand what the things are doing. And also knowing the drawbacks of the various implementations that you've got. Thankfully, most of the time, it matters a lot less than we were told when we were being taught all this stuff because n is typically very small. We always are told to optimize because, you know, as things get big, it's going to get, everything's going to go wrong. But the reason that pe people use ArrayList for everything in Java is because as long as you've got fewer than 10 elements, so you never have to resize the array, ArrayList is faster than LinkedList, even when it comes to random insertion. So it really, you know, a lot of the time it doesn't matter. Also, even when it does matter, it doesn't matter because computers are fast. Modern computers are just ridiculously fast. And you're not using it all the time, and the JIT is just, I don't know how they do it, but they make code go so fast that, again, you, it doesn't matter if you make a mistake a few times. But at the most basic level, a data structure is a holder for data. And what you can do is you can add, remove, or look at things. So adding or removing stuff. Pretty easy, really. And the order that these things are coming is determined by the structure. So you don't necessarily know what the order things are going to come in, but that's OK. And some data structures are actually more restrictive. So you get a first or a last value from them, but you can't just kind of go and peek into the middle of things like a stack. And this is what we call iteration. And I know this is really low level, but you know, this is iteration is processing the values in this collection. And I promise it's going to get a little bit uh, more modern soon. Because we've all written code like that, right? And probably like this. And hopefully many of you are able to use Java 5 and therefore have written stuff like this. But the problem with these sorts of things is it's easy to make a mistake. So this is actually a really bad way to iterate over a linked list because you're having to iterate all the way through the elements to find the ith element each time. So you're doing a whole lot more work than you, should, uh, than you needed to. And you're also, you've got all this logic in your code when really all you wanted to do was go over the elements in your list. So 
you've got this control logic that's making a mess of your otherwise really nice, clean code. And this is why Java 8 had the Collections API support internal iteration. These were the things that they wanted to improve. And this is where all the stuff comes into the Streams API, which is why I've just spent a bit of time talking to you about Collections, which I'm sure you've all loved. But it's an important way to uh, look at why we have Streams. And it's really simple. So this is, this is doing the iteration that we saw with the loops before. And as you can see, we don't have a loop. We've separated the what we want to do from the how we want to do it. Because we don't really care how we iterate over this thing. We're trying to just get each element in turn. So why not just let the, the collection do that bit for us? You can get parallel processing here if the list supports it. And again, you don't have to go through and say, oh, I need to split the list up and submit it to different threads. Again, all of that is handled transparently for you. And you can build functional pipelines with this thing. So processing is easier as well. You can see we've passed a lambda in here saying we want to do something with each bit of data. But you can actually stream and say, I want to map my particular data type to get the, the age for someone. And I'm looking for the, um, the uh, to filter the uh, kids under 15 because I need to know how many children there are uh, in this not this session, but in the, in the classroom that I'm going to be teaching in, say. And the, the important things to notice are we've got intermediate operations and we've got terminal operations. Intermediate operations are things that are in the middle of our pipeline and a terminal operation is something that actually returns a value. So there are useful things about Java 8 streams that they, they've done. Firstly, they're lazy. And what do I mean by lazy? They actually only process data on demand. And that's triggered by the terminal operation. So until you call that terminal operation, you've not looked at any of the elements in that collection at all. They're also able to short circuit. So if you don't need to see the whole stream to get your answer, like find first or find any, then you won't process the whole stream. You'll process until you've found an element, and then you'll get returned the answer true. Of course, if you don't find anything, you do have to look at the whole list, because that's the only way you can know that there wasn't anything. But short circuit means that you can do these things faster. The really crucial thing is that all the way through, the stream has been pulling the data out of the collection. It's not some special model where the collection's pushing stuff at you. There's, there's basically an iterator under the bottom of here. They call it a splitterator because they wanted to come up with a funny name, I think. But So that's streams. But that streams as a collection type. What if we're really dealing with data? So before we had Java 8, when people talked about a stream, they typically meant an input stream or maybe an output stream. But that's what a stream was to people before Java 8. And this was something that you actually still did iterate over. So this looks actually quite a lot like an iteration loop. Now, obviously, this isn't the most efficient way to read from a stream, but sometimes you do want to read a byte at a time. And that is the same iteration logic. But the big problem we've got here is that this input stream may block. So whilst with a collection, you're not going to block on receiving the next value from your iterator. If the iterator says has next, it's got a next value for you right now. Whereas the input stream who knows? You can get a thread stuck waiting for user input. And when I say stuck, I mean genuinely, if it's waiting for someone to push a button on a keyboard with a machine that doesn't have a keyboard, then it really is stuck. And yes, Neo does give you non-blocking input. I do know that. But it is a lot harder to use Neo than it is to use streams. It's why they persist in code now, because Neo is better in a lot of ways, but it is much more difficult. So the way you can think of an input stream is it's an ordered collection of bytes. And you could actually stream over them using Java 8 streams. So you, know, you could do for each byte in this stream. That would be something you could potentially do. It's not in the API, but it, logically it seems kind of like you might be able to make that work. 
but you'd still have this issue where you may block indefinitely. So you start streaming and then the whole thing just grinds to a halt. And if the input's actually coming in asynchronously, you're going to spend lots of time blocking while you wait for the next thing. And you're wasting a lot of time and effort because you're constantly blocking on I.O. with this thread when you, you don't necessarily need or want to. Another big problem you can have is if this data processing function here is slow and the rate of data arrival is fast, then you get, you've got somehow to buffer all of this. You know, if you've got a network buffer, it may fill up. And a rapid burst of data can just completely swamp your consumer. If your, uh, if your buffer grows unboundedly, you can run out of memory. This is, you know, these are bad things. And whilst I've been talking about streams of bytes here, it doesn't really matter whether these are bytes or objects that we're talking about. The same is true. If you've got, a, if you've got something that can block trying to get the next piece of information, or these things are arriving asynchronously, then you, you have problems if you try a normal pool model. And Java 8 streams just aren't very good at this. They weren't designed for it. It's not that they've been done badly. It's just they don't deal well with asynchronous data coming in. So what we need is we need a stream that is able to cope with things being asynchronous. Now, why, why would we want this? Is, well, asynchronous systems do offer better performance, assuming, of course, that you're not bottlenecked on disk or CPU. If you're already at 100% disk access or 100% CPU, going asynchronous will not help you. You can't get more than 100%. Even if you uh, believe your Mac when it tells you you're at 400% CPU usage, you can't get more than all of your CPU core is used. Something that we do find is that asynchronous distributed systems typically scale better because what you're doing is you're not waiting a long time for high latency calls. And when things fail, they tend to fail in a way that makes more sense because they don't usually deadlock themselves and stop reporting stuff. You make a call and you'll end up with something that isn't resolved and eventually will fail because it times itself out. It's also a lot easier to do parallel stuff if you're asynchronous because you're already doing something on a background thread. So something to remember as well is network infrastructure is asynchronous. We think about, oh, well, I've got to do all of this asynchronous programming stuff. If you're talking over the network, your application is already doing asynchronous work. And network engineers, when you talk about async, they just say, well, yeah, of course, that's how everything works. So back to push-based streams. It's, just, it's a fundamentally different thing than your pool-based Java 8 stream. You're pushing data into this processing function. It's not pulling the next element to process. It's as the data arrives, it's pushed into the function. So you may have finished the, pr finished the previous entry. You may not have finished processing the previous entry, but you're still going to get pushed by the thread that's coming in with this new piece of data. So your terminal operation, in order for this to make any sense, is going to have to be asynchronous non-blocking. And this is where promises come in. So the, the name of this talk was where Java Util Stream met or Go SGI Util Promise. Promises are the way that you deal with asynchronous things like the return values from these terminal operations. So all you do is you take a stream and say, my push-based stream should be returning promises. And it's, it's delayed result. It will be resolved later when eventually we found the information that we wanted from our processing. And this is, OSGI promises are good at this. So this is what we'll be, uh, we'll be using for the rest of the talk. So we take our Java 8 stream that we like. I don't know how many of you use them. I do all the time. I think they're great. But we, return, we change our return types. So all the terminal operations become things like this. Previously, we had long count. And now it's a promise of long. Uh, Booleans for any and all match. And then you have the wonderful min and max that return an optional. And now we're going to have a promise of optional, which is less confusing than it sounds. And it does work really well. There are some problems with this, though. We're not quite there with a solution that you'd want to use. Because 
how do we actually know when an asynchronous stream has finished? The thing about pull-based iteration is you can say, do you have a next value? The answer is no. OK, I'm done. With a push-based stream, do you have a next value? I don't know. I'm waiting. So you can't just say, oh, I'm done, because we've got no way of, uh, sorry, we've got no way of indicating that there's no more data. But another problem we've got here is pull-based iteration gives us a natural break. And when I, when I say break, what I mean is we've got a thread that's doing the work, processing elements one at a time, and it won't take the next element until the previous element is done. So if something is computationally difficult or you know, there's some other reason it's going slowly, the processing will slow down, but it will just continue under in a kind of a natural way. It won't suddenly change the characteristics of the system. Push-based system, on the other hand, if you're running slowly and there are events piling up, then you will be overwhelmed. They call it event storming, and it can cause your entire system to fall over. And it can do this even with just one person calling you. If you've got a very eager single-threaded client, because they're not, ne they're not having to wait necessarily, they're just pushing stuff at you asynchronously really fast, they can cause you to blow up. So how do we cope with this? Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're not going to communicate just with objects. We're going to have some kind of event concept. And the reason that we need that is because pushing raw data is just not sufficient. We need an event so we can know that we've potentially reached the end of the stream. That's the thing that will say, there is no more data coming. It's time to finish up your terminal operation. You should also be able to propagate a failure. So something may have gone wrong in the producer, and you want to indicate, not only am I closing, but I'm closing because something went badly wrong. You didn't get all of the data. You got some of the data. Because that's an important thing for the person to know. If, you're, uh, if you iterate uh, with a Java util stream and something goes wrong with when you're getting data from the collection, you don't get a short circuit terminal operation that says, oh, well, I got to the end of the stream. It blew up halfway through, but that's an ending, right? It doesn't. It throws the exception onto you. So we need to know that we didn't receive the full stream. So that's why you've got an event that is an error event. And this is basically the wrapper that we have. It's really simple. We can use an enum that says whether the thing we've got is data, an error, or just a close event that's basically empty, and get us to get hold of that. So nothing complicated, but it's necessary in order to make this streaming concept work. Also, I was talking earlier about network engineers and the fact that they do everything asynchronously. So we should probably learn some of the lessons from them, uh, because a push-based stream is a lot like a network, because you've got this asynchronous delivery. You've got producers and consumers that are maybe running at different speeds. And TCP has already solved the event storm problem, because they have back pressure. And I don't know how much you know about the way TCP works, but basically the producer just keeps getting faster and faster and faster until it stops receiving acts at the same rate it's producing, at which point it backs off a bit. And that's how you get up to the, the right sort of line speed without you know, completely overwhelming the other guy by going full speed right at the start. So our push streams are going to need to do something similar. We're going to need to have a feedback mechanism so that we can tell the data producer, OK, you know, I'm fine with this speed, or slow down, please. You know, we need that feedback. And the simplest way is simply to you, you say, OK, I've received that. Now don't call me again for a while. I'm busy. You know, just, just hold off. And so this is where we get to our consumer. And we've well, we want it to be a functional interface, and we want it to be a functional interface because actually it's really nice to use lambdas for this sort of thing. <coughs> and this is what we've got so far. It's a consumer, it's going to accept an event, and it's going to return a long value to you. And that's uh, so you've got the ability to detect the end of the stream because you're receiving the event, not just the data. But you've also got this back pressure, which is the long. If the long is positive, then the producer needs to wait at least that long. If it's zero, then just keep coming as soon as there's another event to send me. 
And if it's negative, then I'm saying, I need you to stop because you know, I've, I've done whatever I need to do. And this is because your consumer may be something that's doing a short, cir a short circuit operation. So if, for example, it's looking for the first value that meets a certain set of criteria and it spots it, it probably doesn't want to keep receiving the rest of the stream. There could be thousands or tens of thousands or millions even of events to come. And if it's found what it needs after 50, it doesn't need the rest. So, sounds great, doesn't it? Very easy. But there are things that we need to look at because actually we've gone to a new model and we're processing stuff slightly differently now. So we're going to talk about buffering, windowing, and circuit breaker behavior. So I was saying earlier, you're not necessarily going to get called uh, one event at a time. If there are multiple threads coming in, your consumer may receive events on those multiple threads simultaneously. You may also be slow. You know, it, you're doing something computationally difficult, and it's slow. So you, again, may need to be able to be protected from lots of people shouting at you all at once. So buffering allows you to have a thread switch. So the producer's thread that would otherwise be potentially blocked for a long time doing computational work inside your consumer, which might be bad for the, the, the person pushing the event. But it also lets you take multiple threads coming in and then have a single thread that's pushing events to you one at a time if that's the way you need to process them. So you can scale up or down. As I say, you can go down to one, or maybe you've got two threads pushing into you, but you want to do the work in parallel across 10 threads. You can do that too with a buffer. And basically, all you're doing is queuing up incoming data. You saw it. We had a little storm of events. They all came in very fast. And then we're going to pull one and slowly work through the queue. And it doesn't matter that we're going really slowly because the events came in a burst, and then there aren't going to be any for a while. On average, we can keep up with the producer. It just happens that there are bursts where we can't. And a buffer is really good for that. And the buffer itself can return back pressure. So we were saying about the consumer returning back pressure, saying, don't call me for a while. The buffer, based on how full it is, can tell the producer, my buffer's filling up. Maybe, maybe slow down. And this is a built-in feature of the push-based streams that we're talking about. You can just naturally buffer things. You can say, I want this stream to have a buffer now. But what happens when our buffer fills up? So the first option is have an infinite buffer, which you can do, but memory isn't infinite. And if you've got an infinite buffer, my question would be, what do you realistically expect to happen if your buffer just keeps growing and growing and growing? Because if you're not keeping up with the rate of event delivery, then you're never going to keep up with the rate of event delivery. It is just going to keep growing forever. We could block, I suppose. So that question mark is, what do we do with this next event? We could block saying, this queue, we can't add to it yet. But that's not a very asynchronous thing to do. So one option is simply to close the stream, to say, our buffers become full. And actually, you know what? Too, too much data, I give up. And that's actually a really good behavior. And it's called a circuit breaker. And it's exactly the same thing that happens when you suddenly draw too much current in your house because you stuck a fork in the toaster. You know, and it will save your life, this circuit breaker. It will stop your system from falling over because it just goes pop. And you, know, you, you can have an event that comes off and says, yeah, this, this thing broke. And that's fine, because you can go back and you can reset it, and you can work out why you were getting so many events and they weren't being processed fast enough. But what it doesn't do is take out the whole box. It's a really good protection. So that's buffering. Now, windowing, sorry, got a question. So the question is, how would the consumer know about the circuit breaker? And the answer is that the buffer will send an error event to say, I've blown up. And uh, so the consumer just sees it as a, an abnormal termination of the stream. Uh, so windowing. Uh, you may, sometimes you want to process events in batches. 
and uh, you can then aggregate these things together and then forward that on and you've done some intermediate processing to maybe reduce the volume of data. This is the kind of thing you would do maybe in a gateway if you're receiving lots and lots of temperature sensor events. You would maybe do some time averaging or you know, not, not get send every single one onto some cloud server. You would, you would do some processing first. So the batching is either an absolute number of events, so keep going and uh, queuing stuff up until we reach a certain number, or you can do it based on time. So you can say, give me all of the events that come in the next X. And this is actually really similar to buffering. So you can see here we've got an absolute number, and we wait until the buffer is full, and then we say, OK, here you go. There are all your events. And we start queuing up for the next batch. Time is different because what we'll do here is we'll keep queuing up until we reach the time trigger and we'll give you whatever's there. Even if there are no events there, we'll still tell you there were no events in this time period because that's useful information. Now, we've talked a lot about consumption, but we actually do need to be able to produce the events as well. It's not very good to be able to process events if no one can send you any. So this is, uh, so this is the interface that we have. No, I will say all of the interface names we have here are from an RFP, which is uh, not uh, voted or final. So this is all subject to change. But this is stuff you can see in the OSGI design repo right now. So we've got a source of events. And you give a source the consumer, which is the thing it's going to send events to. And it also gives you a closable. And that closable you can use to end the stream. And when I say that, what I, I really mean is, if you've got something that's producing an infinite stream of events, so I talked about temperature <coughs> sensors in an IoT scenario, a temperature sensor, there's no concept of the end of that stream. It's just going to keep sending you events, saying the temperature is this, the temperature is this. There's no end to that. So you may want to close it because you're saying, I'm no longer interested in those events. <coughs> so it gives you a, a way of doing that. So there are some things that, are, that we, we need to do to be helpful, though. So you saw that we had this open method. You can call that lots of times. So there may be multiple people who register with you. You also have to handle the back pressure. So they say, don't call me for a while. And you then need to actually wait and not send them that event. And that's actually, you know, you don't always have that choice. If you're someone who's not producing stuff based on, well, there's been a tick, should I send an event or not? You may be doing it based on the user has um, added something to their shopping basket. And I have to tell you, I, I can't say, oh, I'll, I'll hold off. It was as a result of some real action, and I need to tell you now. So we need to help the producers out, because it, it shouldn't be hard to write this. Now, the th good thing is that a buffer actually means that the producer can choose to just ignore the back pressure. All that will happen is if you've got a circuit breaker, the circuit breaker will pop. And if you don't, then the buffer will get big. You know, but fundamentally, the buffer is there to provide an insulation between the consumer and the producer. And if you choose to just keep sending the events, the buffer will buffer them. In the, I say RFC, yeah, it is an RFC, isn't it? Um, the, it describes a helper which is, gonna, it, which is about managing multiple registrations as well so that you don't have to keep a registry of who you've sent the events to. So you know, that's, that's all well and good, but it's, uh, it's time to actually do a bit of playing. So using a push stream is a lot like a Java 8 stream, but creating it's not quite the same thing. So you would normally take a splitterator or a collection and call stream, and that's how you get your Java 8 stream. Currently, the way we're looking at doing stuff with push streams is to have a factory object that you use to turn a source into a stream. And what that's going to do is it's going to register a custom um, event consumer with it that begins the pipeline. But the, critically, what it doesn't do is it doesn't open that source until you've invoked the terminal operation. This is the equivalent of the laziness of a Java 8 stream. Because we are not doing the open operation until we, are, uh, we know that we need it, no events are going to end up in your pipeline until you've said, I'm done now, here's the terminal operation. You don't need to worry about receiving events on a partially constructed stream, which is really important. 
So, some examples. So, we, we've got uh, something here which is, it, for sake of simplicity, it's integers starting at 0 going up to n minus 1. So, in this case, we're looking for the biggest one and we're going to get event 0 to 9. So, anyone tell me what the answer is? It is nine, wrapped in a promise. It's important. So the first odd number is obviously going to be one, but wrapped in a promise. Combined total. Anyone, uh, anyone care to tell me what that answer is going to be? It's 45. But it's still going to be in a promise, of course, because it's non-blocking. And then we've got the windowed events. So what we're doing here is we're getting 100, uh, 0 to 99, and we're asking for everything that comes in 200 milliseconds. And we're just collecting the number of events we receive in that 200 millisecond period. So the answer to what that will return is depend completely dependent, because it's down to how fast the events come in. We don't know. So let's have a look. I'm assuming people would like me to make this bigger. Anyone remember what the... Okay. Of course you're going to put it down there. Why wouldn't you put it down there? There we go. Yeah, and you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to very quickly uh, stop having these as separate displays because otherwise there's no way I'm going to be able to. Uh, total number of things is um, adding, it, the, there are 100 things in total. And so what we can see is we got a whole bunch of things. It turns out that in our 200 millisecond interval, we typically got four things. Sometimes we got three, which you would expect because they're not coming in exactly evenly spaced. And the whole thing took five and a half seconds to run. So you can see here that's approximately the rate that we're getting stuff from our buffer. But what if we, in this so what I'm doing here is I'm configuring my buffer to offer much less pushback. So previously it was doing 100 milliseconds, now it's doing 10. So what we would expect, if I ran this, is that it would be faster. And it turns out that it is, but we also get a lot more events in our 200 millisecond window because the events are coming in more quickly. And this is why I said it depends for the answer because you can't, you can't tell people what's going to happen. It's entirely dependent on the setup of your system. And just to prove, this was now 1.3 seconds, which was obviously a lot quicker than the previous uh, 5.6 or whatever it was. So that all seems very interesting. But I also mentioned that we could potentially ignore back pressure. So what we're doing here is we're just we're telling the source that it's OK to ignore the back pressure from the buffer. And what do we think is going to happen? It's only 100 events, right? <coughs> and the answer is, I heard someone mutter, it blows up. And it blows up because our queue is full. And that's because we've got these 100 events, but if we look at the default configuration that we have for 
for this guy, uh, you can see that the queue size is only 30. And because the, this guy is just pushing a single thread as fast as he possibly can, by the time our buffer has even notified the thread that's supposed to be <coughs> sending it, the data on, then we've, we, you know, we've overflowed the buffer already. The however many microseconds that if he was waiting, no, gone. So, that was basically all I had to show you. Um, there are obviously some places you can go if you want to find out more about OSGI. The push stream stuff is all uh, actually visible as an RFC right now in GitHub. So if you go to the OSGI design repo, you can see it there. And also, I just want to say we've got nine minutes until the IoT competition, which is happening just over there, so you've got no excuse for not making it. <laughs> Do we have any questions quickly? Do you plan uh, a bridge to um, the Epic Streams, the Epic Streams API, so people have already uh, APIs, for example, using um, uh, Java, So the intent is definitely that it will be easy to connect these things up. Uh, my having used both of the things that you've just said, so we were talking about um, ACA and also RX, uh, I find this to be a much simpler way to actually deal with the stuff because they put a lot of thought into Java 8 streams and they've got a really nice API. Trying to do the kind of functional processing, certainly with RX Java, is quite challenging at times. There are so many objects involved. So uh, yes is the answer to your question, but I think I'll be, I'll be choosing to stick with these. Question How back? Does this to uh, so this was something that actually came about as part of the distributed event admin RFC. It is actually going to be separated out because uh, there's actually no, uh, you may not have noticed, but there's no link to OSGI API. Um, OSGI Promise is actually an independent thing that you can deploy outside OSGI, and it's intended that this probably will be too, so it, that's why it's being separated, but it certainly uh, is something that we will be considering for an update to receiving events asynchronously um, across a distributed system. But that's something that still needs a lot of discussion. Okay. Yeah. Uh, wait time is becoming very difficult in um, configuration. In TCP, it's somehow solved the problem by distributed the uh, annoying or not, and this is why we know that you can send more or you can use your window, etc. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but here, if you are implementing the async consumer, uh, I find it very hard how to define uh, what time to wait. So, um, so for example, if you define too short, you will get coded. If you find too long, then you might wait and uh, have nothing to do. So. Well, and uh, <coughs> that's where buffering will help, because actually, if you if you want to protect yourself, then you can um, make sure that you return either a small value or zero, but have a buffer that produces uh, that reduces you to a single thread, so stuff is only going to come in as fast as you can process it. So you don't necessarily need to use the back pressure if it's difficult for you, but what it does do is it gives you the ability to push back if you need to. And it's one of the things that, uh, well, you, you saw by adjusting the configuration, you can dramatically change the rate at which um, you consume events, and it's important to have that flexibility, but that doesn't mean you have to use it. You can simply return zero and just take stuff as fast as you want. That is an option. Okay. Um, oh, one more. Small hint. Uh, when you use uh, Java 8 uh, streams, um, um, you said, well, it's blocking. Um, but uh, the question is what you do with the, with the thread that calls the API, because if you have a parallel stream that's in Java 8, uh, 
uh, and use the common core join tool, um, the thread that's called is actually helping uh, mm. the computation. So if you don't look, like block a, um, a UI um, uh, loop or something, um, this may be even be sufficient. Okay. All right, well, thank you, everyone. As I said, there's the IoT competition, which at least I need to get to, and I'm hoping a lot of you do too with your submissions. Um, please do evaluate the sessions. It's really important that uh, the presenters get feedback. This doesn't just apply to me, so all of the sessions you've seen today, please make sure that you give, uh, give feedback.